So what happens to carbonate when they're exposed to arid condition and the fluid is evaporated and so concentrated in different ionic species? Some place where you have a high aridity, very hot, and maybe one of the largest um, reservoir in the world would be ideal for this class. Can you guess where I'm bringing you next? If your answer is the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, you are correct. When the general public thinks about petroleum and oil and gas, they often think about Saudi Arabia. This is the, the kingdom of oil, if you want. And it's true. It contains some of the largest oil and gas reservoirs in the world, including Gawar, the number one top large reservoir for, for oil, at least. So it is a fascinating place to visit. And the geology at the surface is also absolutely incredible. The reason we're here, actually, is because of the Arab formations, which contain so much oil. But they crop out at the surface, as you can see. Now, the Arab formations are famous for having carbonate sandwiched with evaporites. And of course, the carbonate is a great reservoir and the evaporite is a great seal. But behind me in that cliff, can you see the evaporite? No, you can't see any evaporite because it has been dissolved. In fact, if you look closely at the cliff, you can see that there's a bit of a chaos going on. And it's because the Arab B has collapsed over the Arab C. So now these two Arab formations, or rather the limestone members of these Arab formation, are in contact. And that's because the evaporite layer that separated them, uh, in, or it still separates them in the subsurface, has been eroded at the outcrop where we stand here today. Um, but you can imagine that at time of deposition, to form those evaporative seals, you needed to have a high evaporative regime. So you had a high potential for diagenetic processes linked to evaporative conditions. And this is, this is the reason this class is taking place in Saudi Arabia, because we'll see some beautiful examples of that. At outcrop, you can still see some of the evaporite. In fact, you can see the heath formation, which is the last stage of evaporite deposition in the Jurassic and is the ultimate seal for the Arab formation. But to do this, you need to go in a cave, in the cave known as Dal Hith, and hence the name of the formation. And here, you can see the entrance of the cave. And at the top of the cave, you see this, this gypsum layer, typical gypsum with lots of nodule in it. And that is typical for gypsum deposited in Sabkha setting. Sabkha, we will see, is a continental type of um, deposit that is can be, or often is, coastal, very close to the ocean. So let's look a little bit at the chemistry of seawater during evaporation. This has been known for a long time. Here's an example from Friedman and Sanders, published in 1978. On the vertical axis, you have the density of the fluid in gram per cubic centimeter of, um, of fluid. And on the horizontal axis, you have the proportion of the initial fluids remaining. Now, this is an experiment done with seawater. And you can see the evolution of the precipitate from that seawater and the evolution of the density of that fluid. So it's obvious we start here at about half of the seawater remaining, a little bit more than half of the seawater remaining. And we go down to about 1% of the seawater remaining. And the, the first observation is that we're concentrating ions in that water. And we see this because the density of this water is increasing tremendously from 1 all the way to 1.3. And the precipitates that we see follow a logical sequence. They're always the same in the same sequence and have different abundance. So first we have the iron oxide which represent a relatively small volume of uh, precipitate. That's why the, there's just a thin black line on the diagram. Then we have calcium carbonate that starts to precipitate. So calcium carbonate can precipitate 
as a chemical sediment if you evaporate seawater. And we've seen an example of this when we looked at the Guadalupian and we saw the, those teepee structure. And I told you, hey, it's cement that pushed the teepee structure up during evaporation. That's a good example of calcium carbonate precipitating. And you can see that at first, the volume of calcium carbonate precipitating is relatively low, but at a fraction of seawater uh, remaining of 0.2, so that means that you only have 20% of seawater remaining, we start to have a large volume of calcium carbonate that precipitates. At some point, we stop precipitating calcium carbonates because we've exhausted the carbonate pool of this seawater. Then what happens is that you start to precipitate a calcium sulfate. So it's gypsum, calcium sulfate, that is precipitated next in the sequence. And once you've exhausted this, towards the end of that process, finally, we start to have precipitation of what we term the salt. So NaCl, um, halite, the table salt. And um, of course, that represents a very large volume of, uh, of the precipitate, but it comes relatively late in that evaporation process. It comes at about 5% of seawater volume remaining. So you really need to evaporate quite a lot before you start having halite. That's why if you look at a basin that is filled with evaporite, it's more often the case that you will find calcite precipitate associated with gypsum, lots of gypsum, like the Hith formation. And it's more difficult to get halite, although in Saudi Arabia here, in the deposition of the Hith, you find in the center of the basin some proper halite. So that, that means that the, um, the evaporation process well, went all the way to halite deposition. And notice also that once you get to these very, very high degrees of evaporation, you can get more exotic minerals like magnesium sulfate, or you can have sylvite, a KCL precipitate, which is also a, a salt that is used for its uh, potassium content, so as a source for, um, for uh, fertilizers, for instance, and a number of other species.